So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our keynote. It's great pleasure for me uh, to welcome Aram Zinrai here between us. Aram came from uh, Washington University, uh, from American University in Washington. Uh, Aram is a media scholar. He deals with relationship between technology, copyright, and media. And as a true scholar, he is a bass guitar player. He, is, he has also his own uh, music band uh, called Dubistry. And he, of course, wrote several books. Uh, one of them called Mashup deal with new emerging uh, remix culture, which is based on transformative use of pre-existing musical works. The other one is called uh, Piracy Crusade. And Aram uh, wrote about uh, me music industry fights against uh, sharing and how it uh, uh, damaged the music market. And his last book is now coming uh, at... Hopefully uh, it's not my last book. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> the third book is now coming at the L Press. It's uh, on intellectual property. The title is People's Guide into Intellectual Property. And uh, I know Aram for two years. We worked together uh, in Bielefeld at Center for Interdisciplinary Study on Ethics of Copying. We were trying to develop uh, alternative rules normative rules for consumption, production, and distribution of copies. Uh, his talk will be on streaming media as battleground. We ask him for a historical background on copyright policy and digital media copies, uh, policy. And we are not only interested in how this cultural policy is influencing the actors within the market, uh, but mostly and especially how uh, this copyright policy does serve as a tool uh, for geopolitics, for uh, international diplomacy. And uh, our special interest is to learn something more, how to regulate audiovisual media services in Czech Republic or in Europe and digital giants. So the floor is yours. Thank you, Pavel. Thank you, all of you, for uh, sticking around for the second half of day two. I'm in the middle of a panic attack right now because over lunch I uh, spilled an entire plate full of vegetarian thali all over uh, poor uh, Stuart's lap, and um, I uh, I feel incredibly guilty. You know, I, I was saying I feel like uh, <laughs> there's a classic uh, kind of Yiddish folktale about the shlemiel and the shlemazel, and the shlemiel is the one who goes to a fancy meal and, and spills his soup, and the shlemazel is the one that he spills it on. So now you know that your esteemed uh, keynoters for today are just a shlemiel and a shlemazel. Um, so I'm going to begin, as I frequently do, by talking about um, what happened in the olden times. And I think as I talk about this, some of the themes that you guys have been talking about for the last two days will begin to kind of emerge uh, uh, as um, as elements in a much more long-standing dynamic than we typically give them credit for, especially when we're doing kind of industry-focused studies. We get very excited about new technologies and how new technologies shape the game and, and how um, you know, new ideas and disruptive uh, business models are, are changing everything. And, and I think part of what I want to talk about here today is that, uh, is that actually, yes, some things are changing, uh, but, but many things are not. And a lot of the strangest externalities that you experience uh, with online screen cultures and industries um, are strange and confusing because they're part of like these pre-existing dynamics and battles and continua that have been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. So let's begin with copyright. So the very first copyright law, uh, well, it's hard to say what the first was, but, but what's often considered to be kind of like ground zero for copyright is the stationer's charter of 1557. And uh, basically, does anybody know the prehistory of copyright here? Have any of you ever heard of the Stationers Company? All right, it's a really interesting story. Basically, if you think about it, copyright like, should not exist, right? Um, expression is not a, uh, a form of property the way that, say, a phone or a pair of shoes is a form of property. And in order for us to believe that it was a form of property, there had to be this amazing kind of uh, lobbying effort that went in. So basically what happened is in the 16th century, following the massive distribution of the printing press, 
there emerged in all these different nations and all these different cities regional uh, publishing industries. And uh, London, for obvious reasons, because it was a national capital, was also a, a capital of the local publishing industry. And when we think about publishing uh, in this era, we're not talking about you know, the kind of FSGs or the Yale Presses or whomever uh, that we have these days. They were called the Stationers Company because there was a, a really no difference between a company that made and sold paper and ink and a company that put ink on paper and a company that commissioned things to be put by ink on paper. All of those functions were undertaken by whoever happened to have a printing press and some people to work it. So the stationer's company was basically a form of, uh, of industry uh, in dealing. It was cartelization, the very first cartelization of the media in history. And the main reason that these guys wanted the crown to grant them a form of copyright was because um, there was also a Scottish publishing, a publishing industry, and the London stationers didn't like the fact that the Scottish publishers were taking all of their, the same stuff that they were publishing and funneling it down to London at half the price. So what they wanted to do was basically to circle the wagons and protect their little cartel from these Scottish uh, publisher uh, malfeasance, right? So from the very beginning, copyright was envisioned as a form of trade protectionism. In fact, the language of authors' rights and uh, incentivizing the public sphere and all this stuff that we think about now in terms of copyright didn't even occur for another 200 years. It wasn't until the Statute of Anne in 1710 that copyright law actually gave ownership to the author. Uh, back here in the 16th century, it belonged to the publisher. And so it was explicitly and exclusively for the purpose of trade protectionism against hostile foreign commercial interests. Funnily enough, though, for the British crown, it had another function, which was censorship. The British crown was convinced that if enough people had the ability to self-publish, to just buy a printing press and start printing pamphlets, uh, you know, the British Empire would fall apart. Who knows? You'd get pamphleteers in the Americas advocating for revolution, all kinds of stuff like that. And lo and behold, of course, it did happen within the next uh, 100 or two years, we began to see the dissolution of the British Empire, largely because of the kind of regionalization of, of political ideology through the independent press. So from the very beginning, the British Crown granted this permission to do in-dealing, to do trade protectionism, to do cartelization to the London publishers as a quid pro quo, that anything that was critical of the Crown, anything that was potentially politically destabilizing would not be published. And that is the kind of, that is the devil's bargain at the heart of intellectual property. Now we flash forward another couple hundred years and we have the first international copyright uh, treaty or accord. It was the Berne Convention of 1886 and this followed very closely on the Paris Convention which was the first international treaty about patents. Uh, and the Berne Convention is really interesting because in the same way that copyright in the form of the Stationers Charter was a form of trade protection by the British against the Scottish, the Berne Convention was kind of a cartelization on a regional scale. It created what we would now think of as, you know, uh, as a kind of uh, globalized free market in the trade of books and maps and charts and all things that were covered by copyright at the time. What's interesting on this slide that you can see, this is Grover Cleveland's, uh, he was uh, the only American president to be president on two non-contiguous terms. Uh, Grover Cleveland's uh, State of the Union address in 1886, right after all these European nations sign on to the Berne Convention. And what Cleveland says is America's not going to sign on to the Berne Convention. Uh, we don't believe in international copyright treaties. Why don't we believe in it? Because what he says, we need to maintain a discriminating duty against the introduction of the works of their brother artists of other countries. So American rights holders, American authors, lobbied the federal government against joining the Berne Convention, uh, specifically because they didn't want to be undersold or outsold by European authors. They didn't want British authors to, to sell books for the same price in the US that American authors could. Uh, because they didn't have the body of work yet that would sustain that kind of trade competition from foreign countries. So America strategically stayed out of the Berne Convention for a hundred years. We did not become signatories until the 1980s because up until that point, there was an economic benefit to the U.S. to stay out of the convention and to impose tariffs and duties on uh, work by foreign authors. 
right? So from the very beginning, again, both copyright and international copyright treaties are conceived of as fundamentally geopolitical, as not about incentivizing this or supporting that or rewarding this. It's about we're, we need to protect our industries from industries in other nations. All right, now I'm not just going to talk about copyright, which is something I sometimes do. There's another form of what you might call media policy that dates very far back. Uh, and this is um, basically moral censorship. So the Catholic Church, every couple of years, used to publish what was known as the Index Librorum, the Index of Books. And it was a list of all the books that uh, publishers in Catholic countries were not allowed to publish. And if people were found with those books or found publishing those books, the books could be burned, the people could be excommunicated, the people could be burned, I guess the books can be excommunicated. But it was, it was, you know, it was real serious censorship that, that, that went basically throughout all the Catholic nations uh, in Europe. And it was adopted, uh, uh, there were kind of regional or nationwide in, indices librora um, that, that were based on what the Catholic Church published. And what you can see here is the German version of the Bible uh, that was printed by Martin Luther. Um, that was basically the raison d'etre for the Index Librorum. Again, this is a crisis that was promulgated by the widespread European proliferation of the printing press, right? That, its capacity to destabilize political power was what prompted the very first media policies which were all aimed at controlling rather than uh, enabling the flow of information across borders. Um, but this is not merely a Western issue, uh, just like it's not merely a copyright issue. Um, we have a concept called cultural protectionism um, that is not merely the domain of the French. We were talking about the French before. I'll get back to the French later. The French love to protect their culture from all of us barbarians. Um, but so did the Japanese. When the Dutch first opened the trade routes to Japan, uh, 600 years ago, um, Japan was all of a sudden inundated with uh, Christianity and with Western uh, and, and proto-enlightenment uh, ideals, which were very threatening to the non-Christian shogunate that controlled the country. And so Shogun Iemetsu uh, actually banned foreign books. You could not have a foreign book on Japanese land for hundreds of years. Uh, they ultimately reversed this when the Dutch lost control uh, there's actually a great novel about this uh, by David Mitchell called The Thousand Autumns of Jacob van der Zoet, uh, which is all about a Dutch uh, merchant living uh, offshore uh, off, off of Nagasaki during this period and about how he kind of sneaks a Bible uh, in through customs when he, when he comes in. Um, another form of what you might now call media policy that dates back really far is selective revisionism where the state actually reserves the right to edit the contents of people's expressions and communications. So this is Elizabeth I, and she very famously excised an entire scene from Shakespeare's Richard II, would not allow the, the play to be published with the scene in it, because the, the scene was about the deposition of a, of a despotic monarch, and uh, she didn't want the people to get ideas, right? So the crown demanded from on high that, you know, if you publish it with a scene in it, you're going to be in big trouble. So I've got some thumb screws waiting for you in my basement. Um, so again, this is a theme that, that we see over and over again through time. But we can, we can trace it back to this moment of panic following the introduction of the first uh, mass media proliferation technologies. Um, there's another form of top-down control uh, that you can think of as media policy that has a long and illustrious history, which is postal censorship and postal surveillance. Now, this really takes two forms historically. One is military postal surveillance, where either, um, you know, even to this day, people working in the military, but even during times of war, civilians, male, would be monitored so that the um, no secrets about the, the movements of, you know, uh, military uh, operations would be revealed uh, to outside parties. Um, but more interestingly, um, there's a second form of postal censorship, which is a moral poster censorship, postal censorship. So in the 19th century, for instance, both in the US and in the UK, there emerged these societies for the uh, suppression of vice, the vice squads. And uh, both in the US and the UK, they took it upon themselves as quasi-governmental organizations. In the US, it was actually the YMCA 
who is in charge of this? A lot of people who go work out at the Y every week don't realize that they have this history, but they do. Um, the YMCA under, in the US under what was known as the Comstock Act for many, many decades around the turn of the 20th century would intercept interpersonal mail and make sure that people were not sending sexually explicit materials. And their definition of sexual explicitness, explicity, anyway, their definition uh, included things like advertisements for birth control. So it was fundamentally about preserving this kind of Victorian patriarchal social order through the suppression of vice. But what it was also about, and what was really happening in places like New York and London during the time that these vice uh, suppression societies were at their peaks, was massive immigrant influx into those cities. And immigrants from Southern Europe and from the East and from Africa, from elsewhere around the world, basically non-white people, uh, the way the whiteness was understood to the, um, to the, the white An Anglo-Saxon Protestant power structures of the time. And so part of what the vice societies were about was preventing um, the, uh, what they saw as the deleterious moral impact of lesser cultures on the, um, on the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant Victorian culture. Uh, and that included Jews like me and Italians and the Irish. There were all kinds of people who didn't merit as white and whose cultural roles were seen as deleterious to these, to these arbiters of morality. Uh, and that justified um, for many, many years in both countries um, state-sponsored postal surveillance. Um, okay, so let's, that's kind of, again, I know you're gonna, you've, you've already seen the threads that I wanna connect. But what I want to do next is to kind of talk beyond European screen cultures and even beyond screen industries and talk a little bit about some of the geopolitics uh, that are influencing the way that uh, digital media operate uh, in a 21st century environment that have impacts and that help to shape screen industries and screen cultures without being explicitly about screen industries or screen cultures. So what do I mean? First of all, um, the Berne Convention, flash forward 110 years, uh, you get this bizarre thing called TRIPS uh, that was created in the 1990s. Do any of you know about TRIPS? Uh, it's short for Trade Relations uh, Aspects of Intellectual Property Rights. Don't ask me how that uh, boils down to TRIPS. But basically, for the first time ever, so okay, so for 100 years, we'd had the Berne Convention, and we'd had a bunch of other international accords. In some case, even the US entered into bilateral accords, even though we didn't join the Berne Convention. And those were about intellectual property. And then you'd have other trade accords that would be about agriculture, or you'd have trade accords about munitions, right? And each one of those, is a, it's a different industry, it was lobbied for by different parties, and it had different rules of the game because you're not gonna trade in corn the same way that you're gonna trade in books until the 1990s. So for the very first time in history, the trade, the international trade in intellectual property was linked intimately to the trade in material goods, to the trade in services, and to the trade in, um, in basically finance regulation, the regulation of financial markets. And all four of these became interdependent. Um, and you could not trade with one, you, you, let me put it this way. So, all of these different aspects of trade were wrapped up in what was known and is still known as the WTO, the World Trade Organization. And what the WTO did for the first time in history is it said, if you want to trade with us, if you want to sell your manganese to us, you're also going to have to enter into these accords where your banks obey our policies, where your intellectual property laws look like our intellectual property laws, right? So if either you're in, it's like, it's like the mean girls in high school, right? Like either you're in the group, in which case you have to wear pink sweats on Thursday and you can't wear sneakers on a Monday, right? You, like you're in for a penny, in for a pound, or else you're out and you're screwed. And what's interesting is that this actually benefits nobody, even most Americans, outside of a handful of uber wealthy American corporations who basically wanted to find a way to strong arm, strong arm developing and uh, not so developing nations into adopting laws that would be friendly to their industries, including their uh, media industries. And um, this was actually bought and paid for by the chief executives of 12 American companies. Susan K. Sell, who's a law professor, has a great book about this. And there was basically one lobbyist, this guy Jacques Gourlain, uh, 
who operated on behalf of what was known as the, Inter the Intellectual Property Council, the IPC. Um, and he, he got not only American lawmakers, but lawmakers around the world to adopt uh, these, uh, these very restrictive trade policies. And um, part of the way that they did it was they actually didn't go through the US trade representative or through the trade representatives of the nations that you all live in. Um, they actually got on the phone and called CEO to CEO. Hey, I'm, I'm the head of a big American um, pharmaceutical corporation. You're the head of a big Swiss pharmaceutical corporation. Let's talk about what we want this intellectual uh, policy aspect of uh, the WTO to look like. Um, and then we'll tell, then we'll buy, we'll buy it from our legislatures. That's basically how it went down. And, and Susan's book is, has it in excruciating detail. So basically what this turned into, in addition to many other aspects of the WTO, is what's known as TRIPS, right? Which is the IP aspect of the WTO. And TRIPS was not only totally revolutionary in the fact that it tied IP's destiny to all these other forms of trade, but it also required crazy new kinds of IP law that had never existed either in the US or elsewhere before. So first of all, it was driven by the needs of industry. It was explicitly driven by the needs of industry, just like the stationer's company charter back in the 16th century, but like copyright law had pretended not to be uh, for several hundred years. Um, it created new forms of intellectual property that had never existed before. It created new categories of protected expression that had never been protected by intellectual property before. It created a mandatory minimum copyright term of an author's life plus 50 years, um, which in many regions of the world tripled or quadrupled the duration of copyright. Um, it created mandatory enforcement mechanisms. So it wasn't enough that you just, if you're a signatory, it's not enough that you just put the law on the books. You actually have to enforce the law. So essentially, you have to become the local police force for the RIAA and the MPAA and the American media cartels. Otherwise, you're gonna get kicked out of the, w the WTO and your entire economy is gonna crash. Um, the punishment for violating intellectual pro these new crazy amped up intellectual property laws changed from being a civil offense to a criminal offense. So according to TRIPS, you have to have laws that make it a, a felony, punishable among other ways by imprisonment to violate intellectual property. Um, countries that don't actually follow up and enforce their laws or don't pass laws that match TRIPS can get sanctioned and essentially economically crushed. And this all ladders up to uh, what was and is still called harmonization. This notion that there's some, some intrinsic good to everybody having the same laws, even though you know uh, a country like Belgium is gonna be importing more movies from the US than exporting to the US, uh, is gonna be importing more pharmaceuticals from Switzerland than exporting to Switzerland, right? And never mind other countries, you know, never mind uh, you know, uh, Nigeria, never mind um, Brazil, right? There are, there are entire regions of the world that don't have media industries, that, well, Brazil has begun to, uh, so is Nigeria, actually, those are bad examples. But let's say Ghana and uh, Ecuador, um, who are WTO signatories, right? Who, who ship very little of their media products to, uh, to European and American nations uh, and uh, import many. So these laws essentially put them into a state of permanent fealty where they are paying royalties on every uh, communication back to American companies. And it just, it's kind of siphoning off their wealth. Okay, at the same time, these new amped up uh, laws create a kind of uh, international set of piracy wars. Uh, this was what my second book, The Piracy Crusade, was about. Um, and they take some very interesting turns. So what we begin to see is um, even newer trade accords like TPP, which is currently still on the, it's kind of on the negotiating table for the US. Trump pulled out of it, then he's back in. He does a lot of that. Uh, but is, is being worked out amongst the Pacific nations, like ACTA, which almost got passed uh, in Europe if it hadn't been for the Polish parliament in the upper left-hand corner uh, donning Guy Fawkes masks in uh, solidarity with the, 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 the rogue hacker group Anonymous and demanding that, uh, that Tusk stop supporting the ACTA accord. Uh, you actually, for the first time in history, both in the US and in Europe, get massive demonstrations where hundreds of thousands of people take to the street to protest against 
the potentially anti-civil liberties, anti-free speech, uh, anti-privacy implications of these hugely ratcheted up IP laws. Um, you also get this kind of, remember I was mentioning before about how TRIPS creates the infrastructure uh, for people who don't, for countries that don't participate to be economically devastated. Um, the mechanism for that in the US is what's known as the Special 301 Report, which you can see in the upper right hand corner. The Special 301 Report is produced by the US Trade Representative every year. And it's basically a list of all of what we consider the rogue nations um, that are not obeying international IP law and therefore need to be um, cut off from all, uh, from all trade ties, need to be sanctioned to the point where they can't uh, operate with us at all, which can basically destroy their economies. Now, what we found out, you remember a couple of years ago when uh, Chelsea Manning, then Bradley Manning, leaked all of those diplomatic cables that the US government had been engaging in? Well, it turns out that the US TR had been using the threat of listing companies on the special 301 report and the devastating economic uh, sanctions that would come along with it as a way to strong arm already um, good faith lawful countries into ramping up their copyright laws higher than America's copyright laws go in terms of maximal enforcement so that the lawmakers could then go back and say, hey, we have to harmonize, look how advanced these nations are. So these international media cartels like the IFPI and the MPAA singled out laws um, in Sweden, in Spain, saying like, look how advanced these countries are. They really care about authors' rights. Um, and, and we should adopt laws like they have. And then the, the diplomatic cables came out and it turned out that we'd basically threatened to bankrupt Spain uh, it, like immediately if they didn't immediately the, um, write these new laws. And of course they did and they were, um, they were widely seen as, as uh, catastrophic and they actually had to take the laws away after a couple of years. It's something I write a lot about in Piracy Crusade. I could go on about it for quite some time. This is just a lovely picture of Kim.com's house in New Zealand getting raided by a SWAT team with dogs for having the temerity to run some internet servers that people could post some stuff to. Um, okay, so there's also a larger modern context of cultural protectionism that, that goes way beyond screen cultures. And this takes many, many different forms. Uh, in the upper left and, and lower left, you can see these kinds of good faith organizations, usually based under the, the umbrella of the United Nations, um, that, you know, that basically recognize that local cultures are precious in and of themselves and need to be preserved in the face of corporatized, globalized monoculture, right? The kind of uh, cultural hegemony of Hollywood, to, to put it bluntly. And so they, they put a lot of kind of like lip service into protecting uh, local cultures, but not much actually comes of it. Actually, this International Network on Cultural Policy that launched at the UN a couple of years ago is already gone. Like their website's down. They're, they're not even functional anymore. Um, there are other kinds of cultural protectionism too that are interesting and hybrid. -y. So for instance, some of you may have shopped for coffee uh, at uh, Starbucks in the last few years and noticed that they sell Ethiopia, Ethiopia Ergachef Chelba. Ergachef, Yergachef. I'm not sure how to say it. Anyway, um, you'll notice there's a little trademark symbol next to Yergachev. And actually, the, uh, the, the, the WTO and the World Intellectual Property Organization, which is affiliated with it, encourage developing nations uh, like Ethiopia to turn their regions into trademarks so that they could sell the regionally associated goods like Ethiopia Ergachefi coffee at a higher price. Uh, to Western distributors of their, of their goods. So, so it's really a form of trade protectionism or a, a form of value inflation, but it's used through the mechanism of intellectual property with the rhetoric of cultural preservationism. So it's, it's, it's somehow suggested that by, by selling Ergachefi coffee through Starbucks, Ethiopia is preserving the heritage of its Ergachefi region. And if you read the, um, I don't have it here, but it's, in, it's gonna be in my new book. If you read the advertising copy that goes along with it, it's so freaking funny because it lays it on super thick. It's like, it's like for millennia, Ethiopia has been renowned as the exotic home of flavors the world over. You know, it's like that, you know, like take part in this miracle. Uh, it's, it's, it's really, I mean, and if you think about it, it's just a coffee bean, right? We're not talking about like 
Ethiopian textiles, we're not talking about Ethiopian cinema, we're talking about coffee beans that are essentially the same species you can get in Java or in Guatemala. Um, we also see much bemoaning over the, French, uh, the death of French culture. France has been moaning about this as long as there's been a French culture. Um, Another interesting example of cultural protectionism and intersecting with IP is urban outfitters. You see this slim young woman's uh, midsection. Uh, they, they sold their major retailer in the US. I don't know if they exist outside the US. Does urban outfitters exist in Europe? They do, right? So they were selling something called Navajo hipster panty. <clears throat> you, all, you know what panties are and you know what hipsters are. Navajos, for those of you who don't know, uh, are a, na a Native American tribe who are um, organized as a sovereign nation within the United States according to centuries old uh, treaties that the US has not done such a great job of holding up their end of the bargain on. But um, this is kind of classic wholesale cultural appropriation. So this, this, uh, this Navajo textile pattern was turned into some women's underpants. Uh, without the permission of the Navajo Nation. And there's been a, a whole kind of legal brouhaha over whether a nation can own the intellectual property that's associated with its cultural traditions. Um, this is an ongoing set of circumstances. I think this case was actually settled, so there's no precedent. Um, someone can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, okay, so there's also right now, and I know that many of you are aware of this, some massive global battles going on over who has the right to communicate and who doesn't have the right to communicate and by what channels and with who listening in, right? So on one side, you have this tremendous uptick in um, you know, kind of uh, internet freedom tools, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, this was during the Turkish uh, you know, uh, uprisings of a couple of years ago, people were putting DNS numbers to bypass the uh, kind of Turkish internet censorship on spray painted on walls, but you also have the widespread adoption of apps like Signal and WhatsApp, uh, Tor uh, and VPNs, all of which one way or another basically take your online communications and wrap them in an encrypted shell so that a third party can't intercept them and see what you're saying to somebody else. Now that sounds pretty good, right, because you can't really have a functional democracy or free society unless people are free to speak privately to each other. Uh, but there are a lot of people who disagree with that claim. Uh, so there's a lot going on at the same time. One of the most uh, scary things that's, that's happening, there's actually been some news on this this week, um, is the widespread proliferation of facial recognition technologies. Not only online, like if I'm looking at my phone and my phone says, oh, you don't look happy, how, how about I serve you an ad for a donut? Um, but more and more of the cities around the, around the world, including places like London and Moscow and um, most of China's major cities, are now rigged with uh, closed caption, uh, closed circuit uh, uh, televisions all over every public space that are then back-ended onto a facial recognition database. And they're basically scanning crowds looking for people whose faces match profiles of suspected uh, or anticipated criminals. I mean, it's, it's, it's like something out of a Philip K. Dick book, only it's actually happening now on a grand scale. Um, we also, in countries that, that sometimes uh, balk at doing things that overtly totalitarian, we see other more subtle stuff. So in the US, we just passed this law called FOSTA, uh, and it's supposedly about fighting online sex trafficking, which is great. Sex trafficking is bad, and it destroys people's lives, and, and it shouldn't happen. Um, but as many, many, many civil liberties advocates and even sex industry advocates uh, impassionately argued to no avail, um, it doesn't actually do that. Uh, what it does is it gives the government uh, a mechanism to surveil interpersonal communications in a way that they haven't had in the past. We see the same thing um, in the UK, where um, st streaming services are being kind of given uh, R18 status uh, across the board if they match. There's also, I don't know how many of you have gotten deep into this, but there are, basically the British government has decided that some things are so bad they should not be allowed to be streamed. Uh, and these include things like spanking, same-sex, uh, you know, uh, relationships, it's, it, it's a pretty biased list of no-nos. Um, of course, we have the extreme version in China with the Golden Shield, aka um, the Great Firewall. And in the UK, they also have the Snoopers Charter, which just passed a year or two ago, which basically says that ISPs have to spy on every place that, that people go 
and keep track of it and be ready to report it uh, at a moment's notice, whether because of suspicions of evil stuff like human trafficking or more mundane stuff like IP violation. Okay, all of which takes us to the context that this pre-conference is about, which is online screen industries and cultures, right? So on the one hand, we have these long-standing practices, historical practices, where um, media policy is being set largely by moral panics and by uh, international mistrust and geopolitics. On the other hand, we have this kind of hothouse of an internet culture where all of these basic infrastructural elements of the platform are highly politicized to the point where there are demonstrations in the streets and whole regimes turning over. Um, you know, it's the defining um, catalyst of the political moment that we're living through, as many of you alluded to in your talks earlier. Okay, so let's talk about these. Uh, and again, I am not getting super granular here. I am certainly not being comprehensive. I'm just going to talk about a couple of examples, and then we can talk about it more during Q&A if you want. So this was the original vision for the European Digital Single Market, the DSM. And I, I, I want to bring your attention to a couple elements in it. First of all, it requires a harmonized copyright regime following the logic of the WTO and TRIPS Plus. But it also wants to allow transmission and consumption of content across borders, which if you remember is part of what is being um, uh, obstructed by the WTO. Um, but it also wants rich cultural diversity, which kind of relies on not having Hollywood set the terms for trade and set the cultural dynamics. Uh, and it also wants new opportunities for content creators, which is kind of hard if you have a cartelized industry. Uh, and it also wants to preserve the financing of EU media, which is kind of hard if, uh, if the US uh, is the principal exporter of media content to, to the EU. Um, so it's a little bit of an understatement to say that the DSM's stated aims are fundamentally in direct conflict with one another. Like, they're all nice to say, and I know why they appear there, because I know who the stakeholders are that lobbied for their inclusion. But the DSM does not yet actually include provisions that allow all of these things to happen, nor I would argue can it, because they're fundamentally at odds with one another. And what's also interesting to me is what's missing from this kind of statement of purpose. Because from an outsider's perspective, what the digital single market really seems like to me is an effort to create a kind of unified European identity and culture backed up by a Europeanized industry that can operate with the kind of scale of resources and, and cultural impact that a US or a China can, right? It's, it's about, you know, basically the EU's vision of becoming school of fish, which was the American vision back when the United States was created as well, although we're much more federal now than, than you guys are. Um, so this, the notion that to, what seems to me to be the obvious purpose of the DSM is left out entirely from the DSM's statement of purpose seems a little off. Uh, and I'd be very curious to hear what those of you who follow the, DM more, the DSM more closely than I do make of that. Um, net neutrality, which was mentioned on one of the panels earlier, is another huge uh, issue that is kind of an externality, but directly plays on, uh, on the streaming market. In the US, we have this, this clown uh, who parties with, with Nazis and then brags about it. Uh, that's what's happening in this video. There's a, there's a Pizzagate conspiracy theorist in this video with uh, FCC chairman Ajit Pai, who basically sold out, as you probably have all read about ad nauseum, sold out American net neutrality to the highest bidder, who seems to be AT&T, who funneled at least half a million dollars through the president's lawyer, Michael Cohen, in the lead up to the election, uh, versus um, Barrick, which is um, doing a much better job of preserving net neutrality for the moment, uh, in the EU, and you can see obviously how that ladders up to fulfilling some of the DSM's aims. Um, one of the nice things about, uh, about the EU is that you have this ban on geo-blocking, right? So, so this kind of uh, regional biases uh, are, uh, are, uh, are illegal, right? You can't allow people from France to, to visit your site but exclude people from Romania. Um, that does not apply to streaming services, as many of you probably know. Why were streaming services, most of which, not all of them, but most of which are American, exempted from the ban on geo-blocking? It certainly doesn't fulfill any of the aims stated in the DSM's uh, statement of purpose. Uh, 
The only conceivable aim uh, is um, you know, jacking up prices for European consumers uh, to the benefit of American corporations, right? Um, now, all this would be no big deal if everybody was free to actually use VPNs. So if I wanted to see some geo-blocked content in France, I could just dial into France on my GPN and see the geo-blocked content. Unfortunately, VPNs are being criminalized around the world as we speak. Part of it is despotic criminalization by regimes that don't want political dissidents to be able to, to communicate freely. So, you know, in China, you can get sent to jail for selling VPNs. Uh, Russia is blocking VPNs. Belarus is blocking Tor, which we don't have time to get into, but some of you know what that is. But at the same time, uh, we actually see um, streaming companies blocking VPNs. Um, be, to preserve their windows, to preserve the in, integrity of their regional markets, uh, to, to get more money from rich market X than from poor market Y. Um, and that's a problem, not only because it's fundamentally discriminatory and against the very point of the DSM and globalized trade, but also because it exacerbates the political problems introduced by the despotic blocking of VPNs. It legitimizes VPN blocking, right, and normalizes it. Um, and lest you think I'm just pointing the finger at Russia and China and Netflix and Hulu, the U.S. has been working very hard to block VPNs. Um, this is the text, you can't see it on the screen, but it's the text of the uh, 2016 bill that essentially would have, uh, would have made it much harder to use encryption for American consumers. Uh, that bill didn't pass, um, but it's entirely likely, given the current climate in the U.S., um, that, uh, that we'll see some kind of ban on encryption uh, in the near future. Um, all of which sucks. Okay, uh, I think this might be my last slide. I'm just about out of time. Um, but you also have this, uh, this new uh, uh, European regulation uh, that supposedly protects consumers. Um, but let's talk about how it protects consumers in a media context. It allows third parties without judicial oversight to demand the removal of content from an online interface, to demand the modification of digital content, um, to order hosting service providers to remove, disable, or restrict access to an online interface, to order domain registries or the registrars to delete fully qualified domain names, and even, it doesn't quite say this in this, this part that I excerpted, but also to surveil um, citizens and to get um, look up information about people who are hosting different sites and files on the internet. Again, this is third parties claiming harm with no judicial oversight, making the demands, and the law requires that they, that they fulfill those demands. Um, GDPR, I'm, not, I'm just going to skip through this because uh, I don't have time, but we can talk about it. So just to wrap things up, we can look at all of those kind of prehistoric trends that we were talking about, trade protectionism, we see it at work in the modern streaming environment. Um, moral censorship, we see it at work in the modern streaming environment. Cultural protection, uh, protectionism, we see it at work in the modern streaming environment. Postal censorship, I would argue, is essentially, you know, when the post office has been replaced by email and texts, banning a VPN or surveilling or demanding a backdoor into a VPN or tour is essentially the same thing as postal censorship, right? You're demanding the right to inspect the packets that travel between any two sovereign citizens. Um, and selective revisionism, right? Um, that new European regulation that allows third parties to remotely and without judicial oversight edit online content claiming harm is really no different than, you know, Elizabeth I demanding that publishers take a scene out of Richard II. Um, Anyway, I'm out of time, but I'm glad to chat some more if you guys have questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your inspiring talk. I totally agree with you that the digital single market is just a label. It was not created by the legislation because the geo-blocking uh, digital walls are still in place. Uh, but uh, I will give uh, the floor to uh, our audience. No, no. It, I mean, it's not anything. Uh, I, I guess it's just a curiosity. Like, how does the copyright argument you're making fit with um, changes and any geopolitics of trademark? Um, oh, trademark? Yeah, or for licensing. I'm thinking about like the technology 
phones, the, you know, these the objects. Surveillance capitalism devices. Yeah, so I mean, is DSM only covers copyright, or does it also cover trademarks? Or is it, um, what, what governs the geopolitics? So, uh, uh, to the best of my knowledge, DSM is only copyright uh, as far as forms of IP go, but there are s analogous battles going on with trademark. For instance, there's a huge um, globalized battle right now over the role of ICANN, which administers domain names uh, for, for the internet, um, as an arbiter of who's a legitimate trademark holder and who isn't. Um, and that is very, very far from resolved. And, and among certain geeky circles, that is, that is you know, at a fever pitch that debate right now. Um, as far as the kind of the, the data worked up by surveillance capitalism, um, you know, the US, uh, the, the US does not recognize a form of intellectual property in data, uh, which uh, the EU does. Um, that was one of the new forms of uh, copyright that was created, um, I don't know, 10 years ago or something. Um, so you can actually own the rights to a database or to the data points in a database in, in the EU. But the EU also has the, uh, the uh, GDPR, which um, circumscribes the power of corporations to collect, um, maintain, analyze, and deploy uh, consumer data. So they're both... Um, more proactive in um, propertizing it and more proactive in, in uh, regulating uh, the use of those properties. Did you want to add something to that? You, you know more about the DSM than I do. It's not only about copyright, it's also about the regulation of audiovisual services. It has nothing to do with copyright, but uh, there are no trademarks. Uh, no other form of IP. Can, uh, well, thank you. Well, I have a few notices and um, maybe First of all, I think um, one note is to the streaming services and their supposed exemption from geoblocking. I mean, all copyrighted sort of uh, goods are exempted. But I think that the view that it's for the benefit of the U.S. corporation is a little bit mistaken because services like Spotify or Google Play or Apple do not have problem with geoblocking in Europe because usually they have pan-European licenses. In music primarily, this is not a problem. So even if there would be a geoblocking or anything, they, they would you know, be available in all EU countries, you know, not because they will have the territorial, and they already have territorial licenses for, the, for all of the EU, as far I know. Um, it's much more there for the benefit of local and small producers who have, um, um, they claim they have uh, troubles with, you know, uh, sort of um, cannibalization of their own content when, you know, available in other countries where they have a different uh, business policy or whatever. And so it's more complex issues, but I, I don't think that it's there for the benefit of the U.S. corporations that, rather than the, you know, small European producers. And second note, the interim measures or uh, you have mentioned that there are, they're supposedly without judicial oversight, I think, there is uh, there is judicial oversight, of course, and they can you know uh, any of these uh, measures can be challenged in court. You no, know, it's, it's it's one thing to be challenged retroactively in court, but that doesn't stop the censorship power of the regulation. Well, right? but judicial oversight would mean before editing or removing somebody's content or surveilling them or erasing them from the internet, you need a judge to weigh in and say. You have a legitimate reason well, to but, do this. Uh, yeah, yeah, but uh, that's, I think it's an incorrect view. If, if someone writes in newspaper and publishes it online that uh, you have raped your neighbor or something, and then you write them, oh, how did you find out this is a completely, uh, you know, made out or something, and then they will say, oh, yeah, actually, we, you know, uh, we are mistaken with the name or something, and then they will correct the information. Is it censorship just because they didn't tell you, hey, sue us, and when the, once the court will say that we have to remove the content, that will be judicially oversight, uh, overseen, and then, then we will remove it. You know, because if, if the, the law says what rights the parties have, and if the one, parties com one party complies because the party sees that it's illegal or something, or that you have the right, 
it does not mean that it has to go to the judiciary every time you need to remove the content or something. So you see no capacity for anti-competitive or uh, politically censorious abuse of this regulation? Oh, as, in, as with any regulation, that's the same in the offline world. If you write to newspaper that they should not uh, write this and that, and so uh, either they will accept your view or they will not, and then you have to go to court. But that doesn't mean that you have to go to court every time and ex ante with any claim you would have, because that would make the whole legal system unworkable, because it's based on the idea that people comply with rules without being forced to, unless, you know, there's a dispute. On, uh, okay, to. well, I mean, we have a philosophical difference, not a factual one, right? So I think prior restraint is fundamentally um, inimical to free speech and to, um, to free markets. And you think that prior restraint is preferable to, um, to uh, judicial oversight. Oh, okay, so, so um, your, your, your uh, I'm, I'm getting to, to your argument. Like the argument would be that the, the prior restraint should be ordered by court and not by an, a public authority other than the court, perhaps. On an ad hoc basis, yes. And not giving blanket powers to unnamed third parties to remove or edit content at their will. Any other questions? Yeah, and uh, that's just the, a note. Uh, Kim.com uh, made on Mega Upload uh, some 200 million dollars revenue a year by selling films music and content and uh so it was not just like uh running a server or something you, you said so i uh, and those money were uh you know stolen from authors artists and they were stolen who, from art from authors and artists so yes. he went into their bank accounts and took their money even if what he, he, he went into their bank accounts and... No, he, he was, he was he selling their property them? without asking them first. And that's the, to you, that's the same thing as, as stealing from them? Yes, basically. Okay. Well, again, we, we don't seem to argue about the facts. We seem to argue about the interpretation of them. Yeah, so you don't think it's a crime? Well, it's obviously a crime because yeah, the laws but, exist. So, okay, so, but it shouldn't be a crime? No. Okay. Um, thank you for that. That was really fascinating. I, I kind of, I agree that like the U.S. companies are getting their way around the world, especially in terms of IP and geoblocking and sort of you know m shaping the borders to their will. It seems to me that throughout the entire history that you s sketch, you know, a lot of this is about power, right? And who has the power to control the flow of capital um, and ideas and expression? Um, I guess I'm sort of just commenting that we're in a very particular moment. I know that the present is confusing, right? And it's like, we don't know what's going to happen. But it just seems to me that now America doesn't, we're quickly losing our standing to sort of say how things go. To be the world police. Yeah. I yeah. mean, like, look at this doofus who's running our country, you know? And That's he's, the kindest word for him I can imagine. Right. And so... I mean, I just think a lot of this stuff, a lot of the more contemporary cases are predicated upon a just general respect for American capitalism that appears maybe to be rapidly disintegrating. Um, and, you know, given our kind of mindless belligerence now, might you envision a future where actually all of this gets very rapidly reversed? Because Absolutely. countries are just like, oh, wait, there's no global police person anymore. There's no global power anymore. It's every nation for themselves or for the EU, every territory for themselves. Um, yeah, and that's sort of just throwing that out there. Like, what would that look like? That's a really smart and interesting question that we could have a hours-long conversation about. What I'll say is this. When I critique the US and American um, cultural hegemony, I'm not suggesting that there's an alternative that's, uh, and I'm not suggesting there's an alternative hegemony that's any preferable. Uh, and I don't, I'm not naive enough to think that we're going to somehow escape hegemony in this networked era. So, uh, you know, I really think there's a battle royale forming between uh, China, EU, US, and the BRICS nations um, over who's going to exert more cultural and economic power through um, a combination of, uh, of communication policy and uh, infrastructural investment. 
and old-fashioned diplomacy. And I agree with you that, that the current administration in the US is severely damaging our credibility. Um, you know, we, we make deals, we break deals. I mean, he, he treats other heads of state like he treated his contractors on his casinos. Like, um, and, and I would not be at all surprised to, to see, you know, American hegemony wane in the very near, year, uh, near term. And as an American, uh, you know, who, while critical of American hegemony, nonetheless prefers it to say Chinese hegemony, uh, uh, I'm really sad to see that happen. I wish we could become our better selves and, and, and actually live up to some of the ideals that we've been promoting since World War II. Yes, I was particularly interested in your critique of the DSM aims and how they are incompatible with each other. And one of the things that informs our research is this dialectic between culture and commerce or commercial interests. And I'm wondering about the European Union, European Commission's aim for digital or for uh, cultural diversity and yeah. how that might emerge through this DSM if indeed one of those aims is prioritized or um, given uh, an opportunity to emerge from these that seem to be so incompatible? Um, it's a great question. Uh, I think the problem is partially definitional. Definitional. Uh, there's a big difference between France making sure that n percent of the music on its radio stations is French language and you know, a, a stateless population like the Roma, you know, having a seat at the table in terms of setting the terms that are uh, going to govern the distribution of um, their content and traditions online, right? Um, I think state, I, I, unfortunately, I think um, knowing what I do of the negotiating process, um, stateless people don't even have a seat at the table. Migrant populations don't even have a seat at the table. I mean. So all the talk of cultural uh, protectionism is really about um, making sure that the Frances and the Germanys of the world who are gonna foot a lot of the bill and who are gonna play a lot of the kind of policing role um, can sell this to their local um, taxpayers and, and voters who are concerned that you know, they don't want these, they don't want Estonians coming in and ruining their beautiful culture. No disrespect to the to the University of Tallinn people in the room, right? So um, I think I, I think ultimately all those efforts are doomed to fail, right? I don't. I, I maybe I'm just I'm just enough of a Marxist to think that the EU cannot be the the regional economic and political power it wants to be without losing some of the um, culturally geographic specificity that it's historically had when it was less federated. I, 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 think, I think it's a trade-off. I, I don't think you can have your cake and eat it, too. I'm sorry if I'm the bearer of bad tidings. You did more research on the music industry than audiovisual industry. Much more. And uh, I would be interested in uh, the music versus audiovisual perspective on uh, what was just said, you know, in terms of territoriality and also anti-piracy initiatives because music is sometimes taken as a kind of role model for uh, film from, from certain uh, perspectives because y you don't have these territoriality issues in such a strong way anymore in Europe and also the regional distributors or national distributors are, are not fighting DSM in the same way in music as mm -hmm. they are doing it in, in film. So what, what is your view on the differences between audiovisual and music and uh, whether the audiovisual will be going in the same direction as music have done? I love that you're taking the question that I asked uh, the panel that, that you were on earlier and throwing it right back at me. And it's actually easier to, to ask than to answer. <laughs> um, so I think one of the most important differences between um, music and audiovisual work is that um, is the mode of consumption is very different. So, you know, I, I might take my family out to a movie once a week, but we have Spotify on our Sonos like six hours a day in our house. So um, there's a much longer tail with music, which means that there's, it's less of an economic and cultural winner-takes-all game, right? If, if I don't take my family to see, you know, 
a French movie, uh, then I, you know, this week, then I'm not going to be taking my family to see any French movies, right? But we might listen to French music, and we do, uh, and Indian music, and uh, you know, um, uh, music from everywhere around the world in the same afternoon. So I, I think just because of that, because the modality of reception is different, that lessens the protectionist tensions quite a bit. Um, uh, what else is different? Um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, um, you know, I'd, I'd say that historically also the music industry has been much better at regionalizing than, than Hollywood has. Um, Hollywood has, I mean, you guys know better than I do, Hollywood has recently discovered that China is a really important market. So they've been making a lot of movies with very little dialogue and where the soundtrack is mostly, mm, ah, oh, right? And that sells in China much better than like, you know, my dinner with Andre or whatever, right? Which is just two guys talking at a dinner table. So, um, so I think most of the Hollywood canon is not easily, as easily regionalizable as most of the musical canon is. And if you look at the structure of the industries, um, you know, up until recently, you know, major labels had like outposts in every country and every major city, um, even throughout the U.S. and in, in all these different cities. And, and their purpose was to kind of serve as feeders that would bring regional musics to global audiences, but also that would be able to create economies of scale tailoring regional industries to regional tastes. And I don't, to my knowledge, Hollywood has never done as much of that either strategically or organizationally as, as the music industry has. I have one more question regarding the cultural diversity because there are two controversial arguments. One, if uh, in favor of geoblocking, geoblocking is protecting cultural diversity in Europe because uh, the audiovisual industry is fragmented, the licensing pra practices are fragmented, and it's helping to preserve the cultural diversity in Europe. The other argument made by Yulia Reda, for example, in European Parliament is. Uh, uh, what's the worse? What's worse is the cultural diversity if you don't have access uh, to the cultural goods. So, uh, uh, if we abolish the geoblocking walls, the digital walls, we would get, uh, we, we could profit, uh, for, make a profit from the cultural diversity in Europe. So, uh, two different arguments, both uh, are related to the cultural diversity. And my question is, how does the look, uh, how does the situation look like in the U.S., where you have a unified market, or what's the licensing practices? Uh, if there is no geoblocking, uh, uh, geoblocking measures. Is there an oligopoly or monopoly of some giant audiovisual media services? Is there a homogenization of a culture? Because these are the arguments audiovisual industry is yeah. putting on the table. If we will abolish the geoblocking, we will have an oligopoly or monopoly, and we will lose our cultural diversity. There will be a homogenization of our culture. I mean, that's the, that's the <clears throat> $10 billion question. I think the panel that, uh, that some of you were on earlier today actually did a good job of demonstrating that, um, that consolidated industries don't necessarily produce monocultures, that they, that they develop methods to, um, to both represent and serve uh, marginalized cultural uh, and social um, populations. Um, but you know, I, I think there's a, there's a limit to the benefit that comes with that, right? Ultimately, even if, you know, the Netflixes and the HBOs of the world are doing a great job of finding, you know, um, the open TVs and the, the Vimeos and the, the, the YouTube, um, you know, uh, incipient stars, um, it's still one or two decision makers at the big corporation who's calling the shots. Um, so ultimately, I think you cannot have uh, frictionless markets without losing some degree of regional and cultural specificity and autonomy. But I, I'm, I'm open to disagreements and... Uh, yeah. Well, I have some experience in the U.S. broadcast market, and when the broadcast laws were liberalized to allow uh, big corporations to own 5,000 radio stations across America and 
where the old laws restricted ownership and there were actual mom and pop and local radio stations and local television stations uh, with local journalists and uh, providing reports on local culture and everything and at people had access to that. When they liberalized the law, then you had uh, big conglomerates operating radio stations where there was a local radio station with no one in it. Yeah, that's the first thing Clear Channel did when they bought 1,250 yeah. stations and so you'd have all the local staff. You'd yeah. have a traffic reporter in Denver reading the traffic report for Bakersfield yep. and the weather. And there, there yeah. was a famous example. There was a, a fire in a city, I think it was in Montana, and they went knocking on the door of the radio station to broadcast the emergency alert, and there was no one there. Yeah, absolutely. And we're seeing the same thing now with Sinclair Broadcasting. And, you know, the kind of frighteningly uh, um, fascistic, uh, you know, uh, state-sponsored um, political messages they're inserting into their so-called local newscasts. And, uh, yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Um, and this is not a left-wing versus right-wing thing either. I mean, um, the law that you're citing, the Telecom Deregulation Act of 1996, was signed into law by Bill Clinton, and Al Gore bragged on it for years, right, claiming he invented the Internet and whatever. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is, this, is, this is a neoliberalism and a globalism problem. And those things can be good. And those, I mean, it's a double-edged sword, like we've been talking about. You know, you can't have the one without the other. Last okay, uh, it's more a comment uh, on, on on your question and also what RM said uh, about uh, geoblocking and uh, that there is a trade-off between uh, regionalism on the one hand and uh, the uh, open access uh, in, a, in, a, in a region on the other hand. Uh, I think we still have to always think about uh, how these things in Europe are funded or financed. And uh, I would totally agree with you if it is uh, only privately funded and uh, basically making their money through copyright royalties. Uh, but they're not. Uh, especially in the film industry, they're highly subsidized. Uh, so we wouldn't lose so much uh, diversity because they are financed completely different uh, than on a free market. From eliminating all geo-blocking, you mean? If you eliminate geo-blocking, yeah. yes. So the, the income through royalties uh, really is just a fraction. Sure. Uh, you're absolutely right. Financing matters. Um, ultimately, though, there's a feedback loop, right, between cultural power and the ability to finance. So over, t over time, I would be concerned that there would be less and less even uh, state support for localized content if, um, uh, if the, the, lack of, uh, the lack of regionalizing uh, mechanisms led to a kind of homogenization of the marketplace. But look, I, I, I want both to be true. I, I hope you're right. Currently, there is no indication that it goes down. It goes up uh, at the moment. Uh, we have, over the last, uh, I think, between 2008 and 2015, uh, movies, uh, feature films, European feature films, went up from about 1,000 a year to uh, now we're 1,600, 1,700. There are new numbers now. I think 1,800 was for 2017 would be then the last number. So it, it's really going up. Uh, also, uh, the uh, employees in the field, uh, the volume, everything, basically because funding goes up. But you're completely right. I mean, that can turn... Uh, they can turn it off. Yeah. yeah. But at the moment, there's no indication for that. So thank you very much for uh, your discussion and for your talk once more. Thank you guys for being here.